the indefatigable <laughs> president of the Old Ashimosan Association, Accra, Joel Edmonetti. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our esteemed speakers, representatives, of various alumni associations. As they say in Ghana these days, all protocols observed. But before I observe those protocols, of course the headmaster, staff and students of Hashimoto School. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to yet another Hashimoto Speaks event. For this particular event, I've received more calls pre-event than I ever have. And most of them have been, why are you guys letting the mobile people speak on the Achimota platform? So I said, guys, calm down. And then on Sunday, I was honored to be invited to a mobile event, the validatory service for the outgoing Ebisa Peng and his team. And then I faced the reverse. Why are you people inviting Ebisa Peng onto your platform? So, I said to them, and I said this morning on radio, relax. The rivalry is alive and well. But at this point in time in our lives, and I used the analogy of football, and I said, Chelsea, Man U, did I say Chelsea? Okay, sorry, not Chelsea. Arsenal, Man U, Liverpool, we still have rivalry, we still have things to fight about. But at this point in time in our lives, the league itself, education in Ghana, that league, is jaundiced. And so it's time for us, even if only for a while, to pack those rivalries and come together to think about Ghana, the entity, and what we all can do to make it work. But on a more serious note, to answer the question about Achimoto Speaks, Achimoto Speaks started seven years ago, when Achimoto turned 90. And at the time, it was a platform to deliver on our mandates as a cross, as we leave school, to go out as living waters to a thirsty land. So we had 12 sessions of Achimoto Speaks in that jubilee year. And that was Achimotans speaking about national issues. But post that event, a deliberate decision was taken to expand Achimoto Speaks beyond just Achimoto Voices. So Achimoto Speaks is a platform created by Achimoto, but that helps to build this nation of ours. This is the land that is thirsty. And there are definitely more people in Ghana than just Achimotans. And that's why since then, twice a year, we have this platform and we invite anybody who has anything positive to say about Ghana to help us move forward onto the platform. And that's why Achimoto speaks today on the topic, models of autonomy for senior secondary education in Ghana, has a keynote speaker, the Ebisapeng elect of the Infantipem Old Boys Association, also has Wegehe, and definitely has Achimoto School. Oh, I think there's West School as well, right? And Achimoto School. So that's, that's just to give you context. On a more serious note, why are we here? And why have we as Achimoto Speaks chosen this particular topic? Like I said at the beginning, ladies and gentlemen, 
we can play ostrich all we like. But truth of the matter is that the education system that most of us in this room benefited from is not what we are running in Ghana today. And we cannot continue to play politics with it because education affects everything else that we do. It gives us our doctors, it gives us our engineers, it gives us our teachers, it gives us everything. So we cannot afford to have a mediocre educational system. So Ashimoto Speaks is asking that today, whether you are NDC, NPP, NCD, and what, and whatever you are, let's pack that and let's have an honest conversation about Ghana and the kind of education we need to be successful. I sit on the board of Achimoto School. I've sat on the board of other private institutions and I see the difference. A good number of us, politicians or otherwise, are not even proud enough to send our children back to the schools that made us who we are today. The question is why? Because truth is, regardless of whatever else we make for ourselves, in cash, kind, mansions, and whatever, our children remain our single biggest investments. And they are the one thing you don't joke with. So instead of taking them into a system that we know is dying, we dodge the system and take them to private schools, international schools, and rather make money for those private schools when we can really create a system that actually keeps the money in the general pool and make sure that more, more people benefit from that general pool. I said this morning that the GES is currently playing player and referee in this game because they are setting policy and they are taking decisions in management even though there are at least two reps on every board of senior high schools from the GES, the board's boards cannot take any decisions. They still have to refer the decisions back to GES. What's the point? Discipline is going down. This weekend, we saw off a former headmaster of Hachimoto School, Accra RWCAB. And the tribute said, he brought discipline into Achimoto School as far as both students and teachers were concerned. Today, regardless of what which student does, regardless of whether a, a particular teacher is a known absentee teacher, the board can't action it. When I've spoken about autonomy, people have said it will cause a class system. I'm sure Moses will disabuse our minds. But truth be told, we can have a system, an autonomous system of management that makes people pay if that's what we decide, but still leaves a quota for people who would otherwise not be able to afford. There are ways around it. The important thing is to bring our minds to the table and have a conversation. Being stubborn and being stuck in the rut and saying, because we're going this way, we are going there till doomsday comes, just doesn't make sense. And that's why this conversation is important. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let me invite upstage a man who I believe, I believe has espoused more on this than I have to start a conversation. He is a trained barrister turned entrepreneur. Our keynote speaker has over 30 years of experience in business development, sales, marketing, and manufacturing. In this period, he has established win-win partnerships with both private and public organizations in the global marketplace and has conceptualized, designed, and build award-winning, identity-focused security products which connect people to solutions and services in a digitalized world. 
He has been honored by multiple notable institutions for his leadership, innovation, and immense contribution to the technology industry in Africa. He is a Bushnapain elect of MOBA, like I said earlier, and has espoused interesting views on educational reforms in Ghana. We look forward to hearing his thoughts tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker, Moses Kwesi Baden Jr. A round of applause, please. Thank you, Joel. You can see I have a digital device and then I have a physical device. It shows you how old I am and still how young I am. Joel has already given my speech for me, so I'll try to cut out parts of it. But thank you for this great platform, I just want to speak. Let me acknowledge the President Joel Nete, Vice President, National Executives, of the great school, Achimota. Let me acknowledge the headmaster, the students of Achimota School. And let me not leave out the fifth and still the Bishop Payne of France from school, the head of the great MOBA tradition, Captain Paul Fojo. Usually, for a certain Ibushia pain, if you were to speak, we would have to speak, we would have to sing the school anthem. But given that I'm only elect, you can get away with it this time. <laughs> I am the fifth Ibushia pain elect, not yet Ibushia pain, and the youngest. So let me say, welcome to my senior boys, and welcome to my junior boys of the Buenaba fraternity. I have a very long speech, and it's probably for the journalists. It's a 22-page speech. As much as possible, I like to write my speeches, so I'll try to not read all of it. I'm going to tell you a story which epitomizes where we are in the current state of secondary school education and the possibility of the demise of these great traditions. And this story is about my primary school, Chapel Hill School, for those who know it. In Takrade. It was formed in 1956 by professionals and business people in the then most populated part of Takrade because you could only come through Ghana in the Takrade port. These people put money together that they didn't hope to take back and formed a school limited by guarantee simply because they did not want to send their children to Takrade International School, which was the British school. They thought that their children should not be trained as Europeans, but as global citizens with an African-centric education, a nationalistic and patriotic zeal to change their country for the better and to put Ghana ahead in the Committee of Nations. Today, that school is closed. It still sits on acres of very expensive land in Chapel, and it's closed. Just this week, I saw on the platform Comments from students who attended the school, who though they don't have any ownership, were very patriotic about how they could start the school and how the founders' vision had been left to die, and how very responsible the children that included me or the founders had not taken good care of our legacy, and I and how we wanted to profit. And I thought this was very wrong. Because indeed, the school was a public school in the English sense, in that it wasn't supposed to be for profit. It was supposed to be invested to grow it in perpetuity. But the stewards of the school were not only the children. It was the administration, the people that were left with money that these people didn't want back to run it. And the school closed. I'm here to announce to you that the fate of Chapel could befall the great Achimota, the great Infantspam, and all the great secondary schools that have created this country if we do nothing. It is for that reason that I have pleasure to accept this invitation to discuss and explore models of autonomy that may prevent our demise and will once again bring the vision of the forefathers of these schools to bear so that we can build another viable period, the golden age of secondary schools that will achieve the vision of its forefathers. 
legally by the directive principles of state policy under our constitution, Article 1, Article 25, 1B. Free education or progressive free education is not something that we desire. It is something that is mandated under our constitution. It's the aspiration of the people of Ghana to ensure that its population is well educated because we do understand through our constitution that education is the single most important catalyst for change. Education is a single factor that will have the most impact on socioeconomic progress, political enlightenment, and the advancement of Ghana. This mandate proves that free education, as reflected in free SHS, is not just a political slogan. It is something that we aspire to. But how we do it and the results of it, it's of great import. The history of second cycle institutions in Ghana fortunately starts with infantum in 1876, 148 years of secondary education. The founding members of the Aboriginal Rights Protection Society and others who formed the Fancy Public Schools Limited aimed at raising funds locally and internationally to fund a school that will be African-centric, that will have the pursuits and the objectives of advancing the interest of Africans. Not Africans in isolation, but Africans trained globally to be in the global market. This was as far back as 1905. Before then, the Wesleyan School, which later became the Richmond School, then fused with the school that was built by the stalwarts of the original Aboriginal Private Rights Protection Society. People like John Mason Saba, John W. Digger Johnson, Jacob Wonsense, J.P. Brown, and J.A. Kesley All alumni of the Wesleyan School, Richmond College, and Fancy School tradition. These same Aboriginal Rights, Rights Protection Society people are the same people who saved the lands of Ghana that we enjoy today for no profit. Mesa Saba, for instance, was supposed to have gone to London to argue the case and return his fee to the chiefs and people of this land so that his advocacy was free. We must discover that patriotism that is built on a certain kind of altruism and enlightenment that together we're stronger and that the generations behind us are as important as the generations that are now here. Through dialogue and negotiations, these men negotiated with the Methodist Church to merge the Fanti Public Schools Limited with the Wesleyan Richmond tradition to form what is now known as Infantspo. It was for that reason that our motto is not in Latin, but in Fanti. Drink your can. Think and look ahead. The current school of a fast one situated on Kwabocho Hills even had the names of the term of the school, first term, second term, infanti. And there's a very great philosophy behind it. Adobber means weeding and clearing the land. Ishuber, tilling and sowing the seeds to a great harvest. And the buber, harvesting the fruits of one's labor. These fancy terms illustrate the life cycles of success. If any of the steps are missed, the likelihood is that success will delude us. For an example, on Fansum, several mission schools were built. Some of the great schools that I want to refer to are at the Southern College, formed in 1910. Augustine's College, formed in 1930. I gave memorial. Zionist High School, 1940, Holy Child School, 1946, Prem Pilot College, 1949, Wesley Girls High School, not a primary college that in, claims to be, have been formed in 1884. I mean the secondary school version. <laughs> but all these schools drew great inspiration from Infantsville. The time is limited, but all these schools had the participation of the great men of Infantsville. Although it started in 1972, 1924, the Great Achimotan School, whose platform I speak on, actually opened in 1927. Unlike in France, 
It was quite a British school. It was called the Prince of Wales College. <laughs> and had its own council to run it. It was born with a diamond spoon in its mouth. It was made an autonomous institution until it was reorganized in 1948. It had departments ranging from kindergarten to teacher training and university. After 1948, the secondary division carried the name Achimoto School. After 1961, the Achimoto School ordinance that stipulated its uniqueness in terms of finances, management was repealed, making it an ordinary secondary school. So when people say they went to Achimota, sometimes I wonder which one they are referring to. Because my brothers and sisters went to Achimota Primary. So, but they called themselves the fine school boys. Anyway. This root of a fine school is taken from Frimpon E, just to make the reference, 2006. Interactions between education, economy, and politics. A case of Ghana's educational system from a historical perspective. Just so I'm not accused of plagiarism. It is notable that enhancement influence ensured the infusion of culture and nationalism ideas in Achimota, despite its government ownership. Prominent enhancement alumni, such as Dr. Emmanuel Kreji Agre, whose famous coach inspired the Achimota Crest, and John Mesa Saba played pivotal roles in Achimota School. Similarly, Ghana National College owes its origins to national routes in Cape Coast, involving enhancement students and teachers who were dismissed by the then colonial government. It's interesting to know that the leader of those routes was one Jasper Chamakel, an enhancement head boy of 1948, and we shall refer to him in another context very soon. Because his son, is my senior boy, Robert Tamaklo, MUBA 79, who is the current board chairman of Chapel Hill School Limited. To my brother, Wellington Maiden, MUBA 75, and they are locked in a continual circle of finding a solution to reopen Chapel Hill School and to run it. Now, Jasper Tamaklo was one of the founding fathers of Chapel Hill School as well. That 1948, rebellious head boy, who then became a founder of Chapel Hill. So you see how the circle goes. Robert Tamaklu is also the grandchild of Harris Blay, the father of Afu Blay, who sits right here, and the nephew to Mary Chin Hesse and Mokwa Blay, and the whole Blay tradition. So you see how history repeats itself. The impact of second cycle institutions transcend academics. It significantly contributes to the peace that we now enjoy in Ghana. At the age of 11, well, some people went later than that because his Tamaks actually finished in France about 24 as head boy. Some of, some of us, latter students, from the age between 11 and 12, we left our parents and went to boarding school with people from all over the, all over the country. And at that age where we had no prejudices, we bonded as brothers. And this is the reason why tribalism is very reduced in Ghana. And these boarding secondary schools have contributed greatly to the peace that we enjoy. And peace is the greatest of them all. Because without peace, everything else fails. The autonomy of these schools were dictated by the fact that many of them were mission schools. And so they had autonomy in place like in France, but the nationalistic men of the Aboriginal Rights Protection Society were able to infuse a national sense into a better agenda and get their way with curriculum, purposes, and objectives. In the case of Achimoto, for instance, it was an independent school that was given autonomy. So maybe there's a nexus between autonomy and success. Autonomy guarantees the amalgamation of stakeholders and the joining of brains in order to get the best outcomes. So that is why you probably invited me to explore these possibilities. 
The introduction of free SHS is a constitutional imperative, and we must applaud the government for the increased enrollment of students who would have otherwise missed out on senior high school education. However, there is a need for critical assessment and bipartisan dialogue to continually enhance educational policies and improve their outcomes, believing that there's nothing in this world that cannot be improved. Education must as much as possible be free if the government can afford it. But when required, there can be a collaboration between public, private, civil societies, NGOs, churches, etc., to improve outcomes based on international benchmarks. So all schools can have various, various kinds of autonomy. But in order to discover what these autonomies are beneficial, we have to look at what's the ultimate objective. What sort of autonomy? What objective? We will find the autonomy is based on looking at benchmarks like high graduation rates and college acceptance rates, focus on rigorous academic acceptable rates, focus on rigorous academic standards, extended learning time, data-driven instructions, and strong school culture. Performance rated on national averages, key performance indicators, and progress measures. Adoption of innovative teaching methods, targeted support for students, and collaboration with external partners. Tailoring educational programs to meet the diverse needs of students and communities. Promotion of innovation, flexibility, and accountability at the school level. Improve student engagement, academic achievement, and school performance. Benchmarking curriculum and pedagogy. Digitization, digitalization, and high IT technical skills to meet the needs of the digital age and the fourth industrial revolution, even as it mutates at a different speed. Ghana's Free Senior High School Initiative was introduced with the noble objectives of democratizing access to education, alleviating financial burdens on families, enhancing infrastructure, and equipping students with the necessary skills for socioeconomic advancement. While these goals remain crucial, the relative of implementation has presently some challenges. One notable consequence has been a strain of education standards the influence of students, the influx of students into the system that has led to overcrowded classrooms, stretched resources, and sometimes difficult learning environments. Additionally, the rapid expansion of infrastructure, the struggle to keep pace with demand, results in inadequate facilities in secondary schools, and in some cases, stressful conditions for students in boarding schools. The implications of these challenges are significant. Quality of education is essential for the future of growth, the future growth of Ghana's youth. Yet the current state of public school post free SHS has raised concerns about standard of, ed of education being provided. Parents recognizing the importance of their children's education and the ability to compete in an increasingly digital and global world are grappling with difficult choices. Many who can afford it feel compelled to transfer their children to private international institutions. Despite the considerable financial strain that this entails, it is deemed that these private schools offer a more superior academic standard to the second schools of old, which did not only offer an academic education, but an education that was culturally rich, nationalistic, and patriotic. These schools gave children the identity and the vital component for a holistic, a holistic education. Those who experienced secondary schools in those decades were fortunate to receive both academic excellence and a culturally enriched experience, which was reclaiming the balance in today's educational landscape. So how do we move forward? In order to move forward, it's necessary, after looking at the history of our secondary schools, to look at which models in the world exist. 
because everything that we're thinking about is possibly done before in various variants, or we can, buy, can combine various models in order to arrive and contextualize these models within our Ghanaian legal framework. So using AI, ChatGPT, and other sources like Africa, Africa Education Watch, etc., I discovered that there are about 13 different models. And I picked these 13 because they're on different continents. And one is connected to the British system, which our colonial umbilical cord is tied to. So let's start from the United Kingdom. Out of the 13, I'll probably speak about five because of the constraints of time, and then mention just a few on other continents. The academic, the academy system in the United Kingdom are publicly funded, but operates independently from local authority control. They have autonomy over curriculum, staffing, and finances, allowing them to innovate and respond effectively to local needs. Academies like the Harris Federation and the Ark Schools have achieved notable academic success and narrowed attainment gaps. For example, schools within the Harris Federation consistently outperform national averages. In key performance indicators, such so as GC, SC results, and progress measures, the autonomy granted to academies enables them to adopt innovative teaching methods, provide targeted support for students, and collaborate with external partners to enhance educational provision by empowering school leaders and governing bodies. Joa mentioned the excruciating control of the Ministry of Education on the boards and the decision making in the school. The academies give that autonomy. The autonomy grant academies enables them to adopt innovative teaching methods, provide targeted support for students, and collaborate with external partners to enhance educational provision by empowering school leaders and governing bodies. Economies can Academies can make strategic decisions that drive improvements in teaching quality, student achievement, and overall school performance. Now, and if we leave the United Kingdom and go to charter schools in the United States, as another model. Charter schools are publicly funded but operated independently, allowing them greater autonomy in various aspects of their operations. They are fully flexible curriculums, are flexible, they design, they predict or influence hiring practices and resource allocations, enabling them to tailor educational programs to meet the needs of their students' population. Successful charter schools and networks such as the Knowledge is Power program, KIPP, have demonstrated improved student outcomes, particularly among underserved communities. KIPP schools, for instance, have consistently achieved higher graduation rates and college acceptance rates exceeding those of traditional public schools. The third model of autonomy that I'd like to talk about are the public-private partnership schools popular in Scandinavia, and in particular, Finland. Yesterday, Finland was voted as the happiest country in the world, so I guess that's a, that's a model we want to look at. Because apart from being economically prosperous and socially active, we want to be happy. So I thought Finland would be a good example. Finland's education system emphasizes collaboration between public and private entities with municipalities, schools, and non-profit organizations working together to deliver education. This collaborative model prioritizes equity, teacher professionalism, and continuous improvement contributing to Finland's reputation for educational excellence. Public-private partnerships in Finland manifest in various forms, including joint initiatives between schools and business community, engagement programs and collaborations between educational institutions and non-governmental organizations are common. For instance, initiatives like 100, a non profit organization based in Finland, which promotes innovation in education by identifying and scaling impactful practices worldwide. 
Now let's take an example from Asia. Community schools in Asia, particularly in Nepal, community schools exemplify a decentralized approach to education management where local communities play a significant role in school governance and decision making. These schools are managed by school management committees, SMCs, comprising community members, parent teachers, and local authority. That's quite a, a new model. Community involvement ensures accountability, responsiveness to local needs, and the effective utilization of resources by empowering communities to take ownership of education. Nepal's community schools have contributed to improved access to education and educational outcomes, particularly in rural and marginalized areas. My last example will be from Latin America, and in particular Mexico. Mexico school autonomy zones, SAZs, initiative grant schools, greater autonomy over budgeting, staffing, curriculum, and pedagogy within designated geographic areas and this is implemented in, in collaboration with local governments, education authorities, and civil society organizations. SAZs aim to promote innovation, flexibility, and accountability at the school level. Participating schools have the freedom to tailor educational programs to meet the diverse needs of students and communities, leading to improved student engagement, academic achievement, and school performance. The remaining seven of eight of these schools are from the tertiary. I think there'll be copies of my speech for those who want to bore themselves with more detail. Well, let me go to the objectives of these models. The models just emphasize that in order to achieve the level of, edu of education at our second cycle institutions, the current structure of the Ministry of Education and the control of the government of Ghana cannot have the ideal outcomes that we desire. And that the call to explore different models of autonomy is the call to save our secondary schools so that they thrive and move to the next generation and do not die. Within the context of secondary school education, the importance of collaborative structures cannot be overstated. They, are, they offer schools the flexibility, control, and responsibility necessary to innovate, adapt to local needs, and drive continuous improvement in teaching quality, student outcomes, and overall school performance. It is said that Free SHS has lifted so many people who otherwise have gone to school, would not have gone to school, into at least being able to read and write and to have a platform on which they can build new knowledge. I believe that the basic skills that anybody needs is math, science, and reading. Because in today's digital age, honestly, people that are above average intelligence can learn whatever they want to learn. The question is, what about people who are below average intelligence? We can have a mass education system, but what is the effect on providing that 3%, 2% of leaders who can take the country to the next level? In 2022-2023, academic year alone, it is said that nearly 200,000 BC graduates who were placed in secondary schools were unable to honor their admissions due to financial constraints. This is from a reference from Amponsa BK and Stania F in 2021. And um, an article titled Critical Analysis of Free, My Free Senior High School. So the statistics are not mine. And also collaborated by Education Policy in Ghana and ISA, International Journal of Research and Engineering Technology, also authored in 20. As a candidate for the fifth Ibu Shepain of Infant Film School, I launched a campaign centered on a new vision for the school, a vision 
of the, that prioritizes collaboration between key stakeholders, including the Methodist Church, the government, and our alumni association, MOBA, to ensure the school's long-term sustainability and success. Central to that vision is the establishment of a new autonomous sustainable model for the digital age, managed by a collaboration of stakeholders and adequately funded to provide high quality education to all students, regardless of their social economic background. This model seeks to strike a balance between financial sustainability and educational excellence, ensuring that the school remains accessible to all while maintaining the high standards of economic rigor and our cultural heritage. The proposed model emphasizes the importance of meritocracy where scholarships are awarded to deserving students based on both financial needs and academic merits. This ensures that those who can afford to pay for education contribute to the school's sustainability whilst also providing opportunities for talented but financially disadvantaged students to access the same global high quality education, all backed by powerful MOBA endowment funding. I called again, as I did in 2013, for the, for the MOBA fund for the restoration of Enfantsman, a $10 million fund, which I learned in 2013, to help power the Enfantsman Renaissance Project and to strengthen MOBA and the Methodist Church to play their critical role in ensuring that the dream of enhancement endures in a new age of hope, passion, and vision. The results of the election, an overwhelming almost 80% vote for my candidature, shows where the MOBA student's heart lies. That the heart of everything the alumni of these secondary schools passionately love their schools and want a sustainable model that would deliver even above the levels that they delivered before. But they do still don't want an elite school. They want a school where the rich who can afford to pay pay and subsidizes the needy but brilliant students so that we can have a meritocratic balanced education that cuts across society as the ideals of the secondary school then were built on. By working together with policy makers and educators, community leaders, and other stakeholders, we can together design and implement policy reforms that leverage alumni, alumni, church, and private sector resources and expertise to enhance educational access and outcomes through a commitment to collaboration and innovation. We can create a more equitable and inclusive educational system that empowers all individuals to reach their full potential and contribute, contribute meaningfully to our country and to society. This collaboration dictates a degree of needed autonomy to give stakeholders some autonomy and control in decision making for their, contribution, for their contribution and support by applying any of these relevant models we have explored that will work in our context. But in exploring this context, we have to be mindful of the legal form of secondary schools that we have in Ghana. In Ghana, we have private schools, and a lot of them international private schools are now receiving the children of Achimotans and Enfanspum and Wesley girls. And even my children go to some of those schools. And when I see the alumni stickers bringing them in, it is very sad. And as you well said, it is sad but practical. But the most important resource that we have, the things we love most, is our children. If we do send our children back to our alma maters, that will be the test that we have won and we have succeeded in implementing the vision of our founding fathers. The private schools are very expensive. Averagely, they cost about $20,000 a year. Then we have the mission schools, like in Fansburg. These schools were built and handed over to mission schools or were built by mission schools and then supported by private sector. These schools were not originally state-owned. In the case of Enfantspum, we believe that since the lands were given to Enfantspum by the founders, especially the leaders of the Aboriginal Rights Protection Society and others, these lands were vested in the Methodist Church and the school. 
And then the mission schools, like a France firm, went to the government for assistance. It is our belief, based on a legal foundation, that we can refuse to accept assistance if we can find another model of autonomy. That does not exclude the government, but includes the government as a junior partner. And then there are government-owned schools, like the great Achimota, with a diamond spoon in its mouth, <laughs> which then has become now an ordinary government school. What happens to these government schools? These government schools can break build on their great history and traditions. They must find a negotiating point, especially since the alumni has the same objective of the France firm to raise a 10 million endowment fund. Because 10 million dollars almost pays for 10 years of government subsidy to your school. When you have cash in your pocket, the government must listen. It is my belief that with the passion and commitment of the alumni, which is reflected in the creation of this fantastic platform, that you can organize to negotiate with the government into a public-private partnership, which will be between the alumni, the government, NGOs, CSOs, and many other enlightened Kenyans like MOBA who believe in the need for Achimota and the great milestones that you have reached, despite our heated competition. We've always assisted Achimota. After all, your first principal was Agri, an advanced home boy. <laughs> so if we all agree that the intervention to build a foundation for enlightened citizens to fit into the global market, where their skills are relevant locally and internationally, is best applied at the secondary school level. But we must say, like Freddie Douglass, who said in 1855, two years before the founding of the finance firm, that the most important thing in education is that it is easier to build a stronger, to bring, build stronger children than to repair broken men. If we once again build stronger children at the secondary level, we will not have to repair broken men. The broken men that we have everywhere. This affects my belief that the impact of education is more deeply felt in secondary schools than in universities. And that the old boarding secondary schools in Ghana demonstrate that, and then we must bring them back in a form that's sustainable. Reverend Lockhart, that famous headmaster of France from 1922, 1925 to 1925, two years before the birth of Achimota, envisioned and set of a France from school. In a few years' time, the people of this country, Ghana, will be amazed at the number of its influential citizens who owe allegiance to this school in France from. Reference Edubwine in France from and the making of Ghana. A government-owned school like Achimota has produced the most presidents, not only of Ghana, but some presidents even in Africa. In France from a mission school, has produced only one prime minister and the most vice presidents for this country. <laughs> and many other secondary schools boast of being a factory pro providing eminent leadership at various levels in this country. Not because of their universities, but because of their secondary schools. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the first prime minister of Ghana, went to Achimota College. I don't know which one, whether it's the teaching one, the secondary one, or the primary one. <laughs> but let's see, he went to Achimota. Kofi Abifa Buzia, the second prime minister of the Second Republic of Ghana, went to the France from school. Dr. Hila Liman, the first president of the Third Republic, went to government teacher training college in Tamale. His vice president, Joseph Dikab Johnson, went to France from school. Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings, the first president of the Fourth Republic, went to Achimota College. 
his vice president called Nkensen Aka, first vice president of the Fourth Republic, went to France Film School. President John Ajikim Kufo, second president of the Fourth Republic, went to Premier College, popularly referred to as the Advanced Mof Kumasi. <laughs> His vice president, <laughs> Ali Mahama, went to Tamil Secondary School. John Evans Atamils, my own lecturer, vice president, and later president of Ghana, went to Achibata College. His vice president, John Mahama, went to Tamil Secondary School. Strangely, went to Achimota, but the primary one. <laughs> John Mahama's vice president, Parkwesi and Mr. Arthur, went to France from school. Now, the current sitting president of the Republic of Ghana, Nana Ado Dankwa Akufado, went to a private secondary school, the Lansdon College in the UK. He's the only one that went to a private school. And this vice president, Mamudu Baumia, went to Tamil Secondary School. So I think we're not doing Tamil Secondary School justice. We're not mentioning them enough. So people like to say, oh, this is our vice president. This is both town and fans for them, and the competition starts. Undoubtedly, the political leadership of this country has been dominated at the apex by Achimota, a government-owned school, and in France, from a private mission school, now assisted by the government. During the Second Republic, key positions, such, key positions such as the Prime Minister, the leader of the majority, the Speaker of Parliament, the leader of the minority in Parliament, and the Chief Justice were all boba boys in one republic. Reference, Professor Dubuayin, in France, from the making of Ghana. Whilst these schools have provided the drivers, and sometimes the driver's mates. <laughs> I wonder if we should blame them for where we are, or where we rank in the world today, or we should praise them for the progress that we've made. I'll leave the debate to you. <laughs> Nevertheless, the products of our boarding school have provided leadership for this country at all levels. Whilst free SHS a great, great achievement for all, in my speech delivered at the 137th speech day at the Fansman School when I was a guest speaker, and I will quote myself, there must be a range of schools at our second cycle of education, and there must be in this range premier schools for premier students, selected on merit and not only by means. These will have to bear disproportionately the weight of leadership equal to their ability. Schools like Achebota and other government-owned secondary schools, because of their legal status, must find a way to transition into these schools that will create the leadership of tomorrow. Mission schools must find a way to take back their schools so that we can produce leaders that will lead the helm of this country. As Joel said, we are also here because we are worried as alumni of these schools that our children go to other schools. We cannot wear our school colors, sing slogans, donate large sums of money to our alma mater, and turn around and send our children to other schools created by foreigners whose beliefs we don't even know. This cannot be right. We must go back to infusing our secondary schools to the same standards as the private schools that we send our children to. We are here because we recognize that once again we must come together as alumni on nonpartisan grounds to create a pressure group against the government, a government, which other government, in order to ensure that the vision of our founding fathers may be preserved. So that our second cycles who can once again be great and deliver on the promise of their founders. May we honor our fathers, our founders, the souls who have labored and bequeathed us with these wonderful secondary schools, which we seek to preserve. May their efforts not be in vain. For all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee before the world confessed. Thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I must applaud 
the Archibaldian Old Students Association for initiating the umbrella organization of the Alumni Alliance. And I'm grateful that you found it fitting to elect as its president, I will be shaping the dynamic, fantastic, and indomitable Captain Pofojo. From Gambanga to Accra, from Riasi to Keta, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you so very much, Ibusia Pinyin elect Moses Braden. Very well thought out, very, very constructive comments on this conversation. Thank you. Now, we'll be going straight into our panel discussion, and I'd like to invite three personalities on stage, extremely knowledgeable and experienced, to join Mr. Moses Baden for further discussions. Our first panelist is a member of the OAA's executive committee. He's a trustee of the Asset Fund and a member of the OAA 1991-year group. He's a former chairman of the OAA Academic Committee and coordinator of the Alliance of Alumni Associations that was formed to advocate for secondary education reform in Ghana. He is the chairman of the Changing Lives Education Fund and managing director of Merton Capital. Ladies and gentlemen, Please, with a round of applause, let's welcome Mr. Yao Bene Amponsa. <laughs> Our next panelist is a Reverend Minister of the Methodist Church of Ghana and was the first female Director General of the Ghana Education Service. She graduated from the University College of Cape Coast in 1967 and started her career as a graduate science teacher. She moved to the Inspectorate Division of the Ghana Education Service as the Science Inspector of Schools and served as a Regional Director of Education in the Eastern Region. She holds an MSc from Emporia State University, Kansas in the USA, a Certificate of Education from Harvard University, also in the USA, and a certificate in management from GIMPA, in addition to several others. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome very Reverend Ama Afobley, a proud alum of Wesley Girls High School. <laughs> Our next panelist is a multiple award-winning education policy analyst and agribusiness expert. He is the founder and executive director at Africa Education Watch, an education think tank working with governments, international organizations, schools, in addition to the media, to influence the development, implementation, monitoring and review of laws, policies, and programs in the education sector to achieve equitable and inclusive access to quality education with relevant learning outcomes. Please help me welcome a proud alum of Winneba Secondary School, Mr. Kufi Asari. <laughs> Mr. Kufi Asari will join us soon. Now, our moderator, is a proud product of Achimoto School. She's a seasoned corporate communications executive and an ace journalist. She's worked in three of Ghana's top media houses as head of news at 3FM and TV3, editor and broadcast journalist at the multimedia 
Limited, Joy FM, and the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. She's currently the manager of corporate communications for the Ghana Grid Company Limited, Gridco. Ladies and gentlemen, with a round of applause, let's welcome Akura Jifa Beho Bampo. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for making time to join us. I know all the acknowledgments have been done earlier, but acknowledgments to the Old Dutch Motor Association and the collaboration to make this possible. And I also acknowledge our distinguished guests this evening. Good evening. I've been told that if you're feeling shy and you don't want to use the mic, you can send us a WhatsApp message. So I'm giving you the number. It's 055-39-8483. The number again is 055-39-8483. So feel free to send us a message if you're listening online, but if you're not willing to step up when the time comes, please feel free to send us a message. So we've heard a lot, and it's a good day in a sense to talk about this. It's a day where we are told three Ghanaians stopped YX um, WASI exams last year, and they were honored today in Sierra Leone. So certainly it's a day where we want to reflect on how we can get better student engagement, have them perform well, and also become leaders. These three young men, I understand, are studying medicine and engineering today. I know this issue is one that has been talked about previously. So I'll start off rather with Mr. Bene, because I know many years ago, Kwame Pienim mooted this idea of a PPP where we would have the support of alumni and other investors, and then also we would have the government as a partner. And this was all in an effort to identify people who would be willing to pay full fees to attend a school like Archmota while running a means test where you get people from lower incomes who can still attend the school. Is that a model that is feasible now? Or we need to, or the time has passed for such a thing. We have to look at new approaches as has been suggested by our keynote speaker. Uh, thank you. And, uh Good evening to everyone. Um, while schools like Infantipim are advocating for independence in the shortest possible time, <laughs> in Achimota, we were founded as a government school. We believe we will always be a government school. So our concept of autonomy is a bit different. I say this um, just to point out that when we see autonomy, even though we're all using the same word, even within the same school system in this country, we need to th be flexible in the definition of it. So for us, autonomy is not about going private will always be owned by the government. But autonomy is about devolving some of the decision-making and authority down to structures that are close to the actual delivery of teaching and learning. So when you have people who are making decisions as close as possible to the classroom level, then you have flexibility in your education that then is suitable to the needs that they can see in their daily interaction in dealing with or in delivering education. That's what leads to the excellent outcomes. And you will see that 
all through the various examples that our keynote speaker gave, the purpose was always targeted at exceptional achievement. So we are not, our model will be what Mr. Pianim said, because the purpose is also to bring in additional funding. That remains the case with us. It hasn't changed. In terms of what is possible, when you look at the recent figures put out by Africa Education Watch in a report, they talk about, for instance, the jump in terms of access. More than 800,000 students enrolled when free SHS came in in 2016, 2017. And as of 2022, 2023, we had 1.3 million. So that's a huge jump of more than 500,000 students. And in terms of the cost, there seems to be a huge financial burden as well of some 5.3 billion, which is about a, billion, a little over a billion annually, which should actually have been, have been 7.6 billion. I'm raising these figures because even if we want to address this. In seeking the autonomy you mentioned, will we really be able to support students and parents nonetheless with the model you suggest? Some may suggest that we may need to find a way to go it alone so that you can rake in more. Otherwise, there will still be restrictions once there's a government involvement. Um, okay, since you use Achimota as the example, I will also use it to illustrate a point. Achimota School's budget for this year is approximately 23 million CDs. Out of that, 17 million is teacher compensation paid directly by GES to the teachers. So the amount available for running the school, a school of just over 4,560 students, is 6 million CDs. Right? That's approximately just under 1,300 CDs for the entire year. Now, this 1,300 CDs includes paying the light bill, keeping all the facilities, repairing um, the repairs and maintenance for classrooms, buying fuel for the bus, all of that, right? Now, what we are saying is, you, I'm wearing, my T-shirt says Asset Fund, Achimata School Endowment Trust Fund. We have a target of raising $10 million within three years. And we, from what our projections are, we can support the school with between 800000 to a $1 million a year, okay? Now, even if about 2,000 out of the 4,560 students in the school, so less than 50%, were to pay 5,000 CDs a year, not the $20,000 that Mr. Baden talked about, just 5,000 CDs a year. That's 10 million CDs, okay, which is almost double the current budget available to the school. And oh, by the way, the school is now receiving disbursements that were due to be paid in 2021 and 2022. So when I say 6, CDs for the, uh, 6 million CDs for the year in 2024, it doesn't mean they will receive the cash, right? So um, the Berza is around here. He's a magician. <laughs> now... If students, just 2,000 out of 4,560 can contribute 10 million CDs for the year, and we are also giving them about a million dollars a year, which our current exchange rate is about 13 million, okay, that's assuming the government continues to pay teachers salaries, that's still about 23 million CDs that the school can use instead of the 6 million. So, so, there are, the so there are opportunities to bridge that gap significantly. Certainly. All right. Let me come to Reverend Ama Afubli. 
Um, at the time, I would interview you quite some time back as Director General GES. I guess we never argued over whether children were getting food in school or not. It was more about strikes a lot of the time. But recently, even uh, Multimedia's Joy FM has undertaken a documentary where they've been looking at what the students get in school, and there's a whole separate debate on that. I'm just wondering for you, how significant a jump things have become from the time you were Director General to where we are now? Because at the time, yes, parents were making some payments, but it seems even with free SHS, there's a concern that they are paying more. I'm just wondering, do you see a way out um, through these models that are being suggested? Thank you very much. Before I say this, and please let me free myself before I get into trouble. Um, I had my O-levels from Wesley Girls, but moved to Abri Girls for my sis four. So I belong to two schools. <laughs> before I ran myself into very serious problems. Hmm. I, I won't answer your question directly, but I accepted to be here because this conversation we are having now is something that we should have had some years ago. And I'm glad it's happening now. The free SHS is a fantastic idea. But the implemented, implementation has brought out some issues that some of us, even before it came to this level, were talking about. Why are we talking about money and all that? It's because we now have overpopulation of students in our schools. Think back, those days, um, a whole school, in fact, when I was the Director General, I, I, I ruled sort of that uh, no school should be more than 1,200, even the big ones. Because teachers should have that personal touch with the students, help groom them. It's not just the academic work. There's so much that has to go into it. But then with this free SHS, which is a fantastic idea. People have taken advantage of it. Um, those who were not, when it started, girls who had dropped out of school, literally, because parents wouldn't support them. Uh, some have even gone on and had children with people that otherwise wouldn't have come their way. We had stories of these girls going back to JSS, taking the exam, going into uh, SHS, bettering themselves. Fantastic ideas. But still the problems that we are talking about persist. Overpopulation. 900 students graduate out of school, and then about uh, 2,000, almost 2,000 students are posted to the same school to be housed. So facilities are being stretched. That is why we are having this conversation to start with. So that we can have semblance of what we enjoyed in our days. It's not only um, what they are being taught and that's another issue. But health-wise, how are we preparing these children in our schools? Same amount of toilets that were in the schools when we were there are still being used. And the whole school wasn't even a thousand. Now over, oh, it's almost 4,000. Trying to use same facilities. Dining hall is stretched. 
Teachers are being overstretched in the sense that they cannot have proper control over all these numbers like they did. I mean, in our day, you dare not pass somewhere because a teacher will spot you and the teacher knows your name. Now the students themselves don't even know each other. So form one is at, form one is at home now, and other side. We are. What I'm trying to say is, government is trying to make the best out of what we have, but at the same time, it is costing us something in quality, and that's why we are having this conversation. How do we address it? One of the things mentioned is that currently you have a situation where the Ghana Education Service is also represented on, on school boards. They are also um, engaging policy-wise. And so sometimes the schools can't take decisions. Is that what it's supposed to be? Is that how it's always been? How can we shift away from what seems to be probably emasculation? of the professionals themselves so that they can take decisions that can help improve the situation or favor policies that will bring in funding. You see, the control of um, ministry over our schools and all is now very tight. GES was formed so that teachers and schools will be able to have the freedom to operate. GES was supposed to be the implementation as side of it. But then policies are made now by the government, not just this government, it's been some well, ministry, let me put it that way. And then ministry also wants to sort of implement in the schools. It, it, it's because see, the politics in Ghana has permeated into everything. So the head research, the school board itself, it, it finds it rather difficult to even take decisions that they think would be for the good of the school. Is it fair to say that if there's to be any implementation of any policy of autonomy for secondary schools in Ghana, it will essentially have to come from the top down. That shouldn't be the case, but this is what is happening. It's happening. Mm. All right. You know, so you ha they are all treading on very thin line, very careful not to offend. You know, so and uh, I'm I, I I am hoping that this conversation will go on further in other circles so we can have some schools that are running and the bodies that are running the schools have the uh, responsibility of making sure the school runs. Controlling funds and all for the school. Okay. You know, all I right. don't know, but I'll come back to you, uh, Reverend Amafubli. Let me announce the number again. It's 055-339-8483. 055-339-8483. So I'll come now to Kofi um, Asari. I've been quoting you a bit already. Um, but your own report talks about the various countries that are already implementing some form of free SHS, which we've joined, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, South Africa, us. I shared some of the figures. I think ultimately what many would want to know, and since I can say I had the experience of also trying to put my daughter in secondary school, unfortunately I failed the test. I could not send her to my alma mater. I don't, Reverend says there's overpopulation. I'm not sure about that because it seems there's a demand for certain particular schools. There are other schools, we are told, that tend to have space and can accommodate others. I'm just wondering your thoughts on a potential model 
to help some of these what we call category A schools so that they can run a certain parallel approach where they can have those who want to pay fully pay and then a means test is adopted for lower income or those who are brilliant but needy and at the same time expand facilities so that maybe they can even accept more. Since that, those are the schools, people want to go to Wesley Girls, people want to go to Achimota, they want to go to Infant Spin. If you give them another option elsewhere, the children themselves are very much aware. They will tell you no. When my daughter didn't get Wesley Girls, then she said she would rather go elsewhere. So she went to another school which has a founder from Wesley Girls. That was her preference, yes. <laughs> That was her preference. So, Kofi, what, what are your thoughts on, on such models? Thank you very much. And I'm um, sorry I was late. I, I was, um, there's a similar debate going on live on Joy News, and uh, I had committed to that way earlier. But it's a three-hour program, so after this, I'll join them again. <laughs> so I did um, 6 to 6.45 there, and then... Um, I came here, but I think um, this, this, this is a great place to be. Uh, prof, I salute. <laughs> uh, there are many props here, Prof. Diamonds. Anyway, um, it, it's a tricky issue. Um, it's a tricky issue because in an attempt to try and get those who can pay to pay and pay enough to take care of those who cannot pay, perhaps allow those who cannot pay to enjoy truly free secondary. What we have is not truly free. So to enjoy truly free second education, it makes a lot of sense. Well, why are we discussing this? Because there's no money, right? And why, why is there no money? Because the model of free second education we choose is the most expensive one in the world. There's no country in the world where boarding education is free. It, it doesn't happen in the public sector. No country, not even in Norway or Denmark. And um, apart from that, our approach to free second education is quite comprehensive. Comprehensive in, the, in a sense that if you go to Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone started their free senior high school a year after we did, okay, but you, you still need to meet a cutoff to go to secondary school and then there are some restrictions. And so infrastructural inhibitions remain. And so instead of pushing everybody in school, they've decided that gradually we expand infrastructure and as we expand infrastructure, we admit more. It's just like the independence, the pre-independent debate about independence now or independence gradually. So where we've got into at 70% enrollment rate at secondary, which is one of the highest in the in the sub, I mean in West Africa, um, it's because we decided to overcrowd ourselves and get everybody in school from I agree, state, I agree, 52 to I agree, uh, you understand. But the benefit is that it leave no one behind. That's the benefit, leave no one behind. But then it comes with this benefit, overcrowding and then feeding issues. Feeding issues because 70% of the free senior high school budget is for feeding, 70%. So at Chimota, 4,000 students, government spends about 10 million cities a year. That's government's budget for Achimota, is 10 million cities a year. Assuming everyone there is a border, that's 10 million cities a year. If 20% are day students, they are doing about 8 million cities a year. But at the end of that academic year, you are not likely to, at the current budget credibility rate of 52%, by the end of 2022, you are not likely to receive more than 50, half of the money um, um, by the end of the academic year. So you always need funding. So in, within the context of such constricted funding arrangement, I will always admit that it makes a lot of policy sense to allow those, not allow those who can pay, but to admit a particular, a, a particular category of students and make them fee paying because they can pay, okay? And then if they pay 5,000 cities a year, it means they are paying for themselves and paying for another person who cannot pay at all. That is the meaning. Government pays maximum of 2,400 a year. Free senior high school means government pays 2,400 cities a year max for a border. A day student is about 1,008 or 1,009, thereabout. So if you pay 5,000, you are paying for two people. Okay, so if you admit, out of the 4,000 at the Timota, if you admit 1,000 into fee paying, and then they are paying 5,000 a year, it means that if government costing is right, then you have paid for another person. 
and so someone else will enjoy free in your hand. It makes a lot of sense. It, it does. And I'm not so, too sure so what government means. Yeah, Kofi, what, what I would like you to help us transition to is how do we get to that point? So the universities have a similar model. They have fee-paying students, and they know certain courses are in demand. They set the cutoff high. You don't get aggregate four or five. You don't get administration. But if you get seven or eight and you can pay for it, yeah. you go in and do it. Yeah. I want to know how, how we do can, we get there? How do we get to the point where the schools or together with government or if it's yeah. the alumni, who is their advocate? Yeah. Does that need legislation, for instance, in order to get them to this point? Because no, I doubt any government will agree to do this for Achimota alone. No. Um, so how we get there is, is, one, the conversation we're having. To begin to have a conversation around it. Conversations around equitable financing. What is equitable financing? Ensuring that those who can pay more, pay more. And those who can pay less, pay less. And those who can pay at all, they shouldn't pay at all. But no one is denied access. That is equitable financing. And by so doing, your equitable financing approach should guarantee equitable access. 30% students are coming from public basic schools because we know that that's the schools that um, low-income people attend. Okay. So we are, not, we are not affecting that. Okay. So in our bid to enjoy our education, we are not, we are not tinkering with the, the education that the poor or the poorest are enjoying. So that's the first thing. Have the conversation to give the assurances that equitable financing and equitable assets um, will go together. And then the third most important thing is that the timing, I think the timing for this discussion is now. Because in the past six years, this was a no, no, no. But in January, government admitted in the, I in the IMF January review reports, um, government is self-committed to undertake um, a, a cost, cost rationalization. And within the context of the IMF cost rationalization, you are, you are obviously um, going to rationalize costs by spending more on the poor and then less on the rich. So the admission by government, and it wasn't the IMF telling governments. In the last meeting, I happened to serve on the IMF review meeting with society. In the last meeting we had with the IMF um, team in Ghana to, um, in, in February, it was the government of Ghana making this proposal that they would do it. So if government is saying they would do it, then it opens a space for discussions around how can, gov how can we support government to rationalize the costing around the free scenario. So I think that a space is opened by government admitting in the, 20, in the January IMF report that it will rationalize the free, free scenario costs. Thank you very much, Mr. Sari. Yes, um, um, Mr. Bennett, please, quick point. Then I would like to come to our keynote speaker. So um, regarding the how, since 2018, uh, the OAA, we've had a full concept paper. Since 2018, we've had a full concept paper. Now, um, the current Minister of Education, be before when he was deputy, we shared it with him and we discussed it with him privately. Since he's become the substantive minister, he's aware of it, but he's resolutely refused to discuss it with us and with the Alumni Alliance. So with the how, it's not that the idea is not there, it's not that it's not being presented, it's not that it's not being developed, but what we are lacking is honesty in policy making and lack of will power on the part of those making the decision. Just let me come to our keynote speaker and I'll, I'll come back, uh, Reverend uh, Afobli. So you've heard the issues, the issues re reflecting access challenges, the financial burden, lack of a means test, and the need for some strategic partnerships. Let me um, zero in on the means test. I'm not sure what your perspective is, but I find that it's something as a country we don't like to do. When we need to identify the poorest of the poor or the needy, we never want to do it. We like to implement things wholesale. 
for whatever reason, I'm not sure. I don't know, what do you think about how we go about identifying a proper means test so that we can do this proper identification? I know these are lots of students we are talking about. We are told what, almost 200,000 or more of them write the BC, for instance. How will I know how many of them will not be able to pick up their admissions even if they get it? I think that's the point to start from before we can then identify those who can pay and then you have a proper structure for them. You know, I believe that everything that is driven by market forces and demand naturally finds a selection in um, excellence, right? So if you look at boarding the schools, as you mentioned, we, we chose the most expensive way to do the, um, there's no boarding school in the UK, for instance, that you go for free <laughs> because it's expensive. So my, my thinking is that if you want to go to boarding school, then you have to pay for it. If you can't pay for it, then you have to be very bright. And if you're competing, for instance, then fans when we used to pay fees, right? So nobody, your parents couldn't do much. If you did come and translate, you didn't meet the grade, you weren't going. If you passed, you get the prospectus saying, hey, you made it, you got past the line. These are your fees and this is what you have to bring. We still used to have students who used to have scholarships. I remember very well, and there, there was some degree of honesty and transparency about the scholarships. Because I remember my father, for instance, had Cocoa Farm, so they gave me forms of Cocoa Scholarship. You know, so we took it to him and said, hey, we got some Cocoa Scholarship forms. And he said, those forms are not for you, they're for the people who can't afford it. Are you with me? So if you have a system where you have to excel, even before you pay. You know, so we test those who excel before you pay. And then we have those who excel, but who can't pay, but they've made the grade. Then we do the means testing. And then we have a financial model that shows what percentage of people fee paying can support, what percentage of people non-fee paying can support what the throughput of the school is, benchmarking international standards, right? Then you have a framework for implementation. For instance, Reverend Afu mentioned that there used to be 1,000 people in, in, or in, in let's say, Achibocha. Now it's 4,000, right? There is a, there are international benchmarks about if you have a boarding school and there are 1,000 people through and you have X amount of toilets and X amount of bathrooms, when the rising bell comes, it takes one hour to get ready and to be at assembly. You have four times that number. When the rising bell goes, it takes four hours to get assembly. The conclusion is that half the people will not bath. I mean, it's, it's math. <laughs> you know, it's math. So Maybe in just the single-sex schools, not in Achimota. <laughs> <laughs> no, even the girls' school, they are lying because we've got the ratio, right? I mean, it takes so many minutes to go through. <laughs> so you come to a certain empirical understanding of the data. Are you me? If you get the model, I can put an artificial intelligence model now for schooling bench class. It can tell you exactly how many students can fit in which school, how long it will take them to bath and dress to school, and you find that 4,000 people with that tremendous infrastructure is impossible. So we don't do it. You know, we, we now have data that we can use to build sustainable models that work. Mm -hmm. Now, if we work these models and we get, I mean, how does um, SOS do it? SOS has orphans and that's fee paying children. Right? The, the term costs about $10,000 for the people who pay fees. That's $20,000 a year. That's 100 people paying for the whole Achimota budget. 100 people paying $20,000 a year is equals $23 million plus change. Are you me? So if I can find 100 people to pay that fee, because I see more than 100 enforcement boys putting their children there. And why would they want to send their children to some dead Austrian school whose philosophy they don't know? where they can send those children to the school of Mesa Saba. They would, if it was good enough. And if I got 100 of them to pay, I could subsidize the whole of Achibota. So given the conversation that's going on, I'm not an educational expert, but 
just looking at the mob thing. It seems to me that we should have those who can pay, especially the alumni people who have money who can pay. They actually want to go to their schools. They just think, you know, you try to take, I'm not going to mention my wife here. She's way, <laughs> way in 91, so they were right here. <laughs> And Shimota girls, they like a fast from boys, but that's another matter. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> having, you know, if you, you take your son and you tell your wife that I'm going to take this boy to France and he gives you a certain kind of look and says that, you know, something, I don't want to say, then you start thinking twice. But the women always know what's good for their children. So if the school was worth the money, he would, she would allow you to pay that 20000 I just need 100 people like that to then transfer. They can subsidize whole villages of brilliant people. And we won't have 4,000 people. Because the school in France cannot take 4,000. We're doing a study now by one of the subject experts in our group to find out these parameters I've told you. How many children can actually fit into a France room and have an education in a serious environment that's conducive for a certain kind of education that meet global standards. We don't know that. We have to find that out. When we find that out, we work backwards. Mm. Are you me? Because it's a wishful thing. Of course, it's great to have free SHS. It's, an, it's a constitutional imperative, as I mentioned. If everybody could go to school and we could afford it, that would be great. Maybe we'll get there one day. But today, yes, let everybody go to school. But let's change the paradigm. Maybe those who cannot afford it and are not so bright should go to day schools because it's cheaper. Let those who want the boarding school pay top dollar for it and subsidize the bright who should be mixed with them in order to create an equitable society. Mm -hmm. And let everybody go to school, but not the same school. Let's find a way that we have a natural selection of talent without discrimination or elitism. And let's make sure the financial model is sustainable. I would say that that framework should work. I don't know the detail, but there are subject expert matters in all these areas, who can give us the data to make the decisions? Okay. Um, Reverend uh, Amafulwe, that's a good way to transition to you because Mr. Bennett has said the minister has a paper, there's been no action on it. What would it take to get to the point that the two gentlemen, Mr. Bennett and um, our, our keynote speaker, want us to get to? Because much as, yes, we have to work backwards, get data, we need to be sure that the powers that be will take a look at it. Yeah, that's why I said that uh, these are conversations that should go. This is the beginning. We need a lot more. And then should alumni come together, Wesley Girls and Francima, all these big schools, should they come together, push for Is something not, like not this? Not alumni alone. Let the missions, for example, who started those schools also get together and be thinking about how they can help. And if it goes on and then a paper is really developed, taking it into consideration the, le the legislations and things that should take place and it's presented, I'm sure somebody will look at it. But it went, for example, this one, it went to the minister, it's just for much water. So he can afford to put it aside. You know. But when it's a collective thing, that, that's what I'm saying, that if a lot of thought has gone into it, a lot of research goes into it, and then uh, there's the political will to also buy into it, it will happen. It's the beginning. It will happen someday. I'm so convinced about this. We cannot go down, down, down. Ghana is not an island. Go to America, like he said, UK, as he said. We have independent schools where if you want to go there, you pay. Mr. Bena, you wanted to make a point. Go ahead. Um, the proposal was not just from Achimota. In... Um, on 24th July 2021, we had seen the signs, um, students were hungry in school, all of that. So we wrote to various alumni associations, and we met at the Academy of Arts and Sciences. 
about 26 alumni associations turned up. And that was when we formed what's called the Alumni Alliance, which our keynote speaker referred to, and the chairman is Captain Paul Fojo, the current Ebushian Fenyu. Um, we wrote to the minister, and we said, things are not going well. We want to meet with you, understand what your objectives are, and see how we can help. He's flatly refused to meet with us. Um, it was, I think, last year that he invited us, and then he canceled the day before and, and said he would reach out to us again, and he hasn't. So it's not just an Achimota initiative. Right now, we have a WhatsApp platform, very active, with, uh, I think, 120 members or so. But also, if I can take advantage of comments on Means testing. Uh, sometimes we make it seem as if it's difficult, but I'm into technology and I can tell you that's the easiest question to answer. We currently do it for the, um, is it livelihood enhancement? Sorry, leap. leap. <laughs> we use, so we're doing means testing in Ghana now, leap. If you don't know, there are uh, families on welfare in Ghana who are paid, okay, every month. I think it's 300 CDs or so. I don't know if it's changed. We also use it for the student loan. Now, off the top of my head, I can give you about seven or eight databases. Government databases. So data that's already sitting with government. That, if you mine, will give you an accurate economic profile of every single adult Ghanaian. Just by the websites you visit, Google is able to tell your economic profile. Okay? Now, this is not about visiting web. This is about data that you have willingly given to government. And I'll give you an example. Government knows where you live. Okay? Through Mr. Baden's database, the National ID, um, the Electoral Commission, all of that. So, government knows where you live or the area, at least. Government knows if you own a company, Registrar General. They know if you're a director of a company, knows where you work, has your SNET, has your tax records, okay? Um, national Health Insurance, knows if you own a car, well, two cars, whatever. You know, I, there are various databases I can go through all of them. Every adult Ghanaian will appear in at least three of those databases, and that's enough to construct the economic profile of that adult Ghanaian. So means testing, doing it is not a problem. It's the willingness to do it that is the problem, and if we see the need for it. All right, thank you very much. And that was, you've already answered one question that came to me from William Otting Mensa. So I hope, William, you are satisfied with that answer. I have a few more questions here, so let me um, raise them. This one from Anthony at Achmota. With our current polarized political climate, can any government in the near future have the political will to cede autonomy? to category A senior high schools. Reverend Afugle, do you want to take that? I believe it's possible. You believe it's possible? I believe it's possible. Let's go on talking. Let's go on exploring. And then keep knocking. Yeah, we should keep knocking. Kofi, you are in the space regularly enough. You indicate that this is a good time to have this conversation with all the suggestions from the IMF et, et, et al. But category A schools are quite prized. In fact, I don't seem, think I've seen in other countries the love for secondary school. A lot of them love their universities. I do some work on and off for the University of Ghana for which I'm an alumnus. I don't think the fever is there like for secondary schools in this country. And even the national science and math quiz, the way people go after each other or, or for those competitions shows that for the secondary schools is a thing. It's unusual in Ghana, I must be honest. I think in Nigeria, it's just a few schools like Queen's College, King's College, 
that have that kind of, you know, drive. So, can we ever see a time where there will be the political will to give Category A schools the autonomy they may so desire? No, I, I don't think so. Why? I don't see it. Um, and I don't see it happening. Yeah, and, and even the kind of reforms we are discussing, the kind of reforms we are discussing, I'm talking about the kind of reforms where we are asking those who can pay to pay so that we can have more money to fund a program which is underfunded, right? Even that, even that is, is difficult to have. You understand? It, yes. Are you, you are saying it's difficult. Is that because no. of the current circumstance we are in yeah. economically? So the point, the point I want to make is that the point I want to make is that that discussion is difficult now because of the politicized nature of the free senior high school policy. It makes it very difficult. In all the countries where free senior high school was launched or conceived on political platforms like Uganda, you can't talk about the issues. Talk about it, M7 will come after you. So that is, that is, it's not, you know, so it's difficult. But the other way is that, that the other side is that I also don't see the next political administration doing anything about this. Because of the way the thing has been arranged, eh, if you tinker with it, <laughs> it's, like, it's like arranging a brick, uh, 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 arranging a whole brick tower without mortar. So the least push, everything will crumble. So if you look carefully at the manifesto of the two parties from, 26, from 2020, no one, no, 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 no one is talking about review again, oh, because <laughs> the people like they are free regardless of how it comes. But the point I want to make is this that I see this rather happening. What do I see happening? What do we want to see in the autonomy? What and what and what and what do we want to see to call autonomy? Let's disintegrate it. If one, having a greater share of admissions by all students is one, one slice of the, of the autonomy, then we strategize on how to negotiate for that. Two, if having a greater representation on the board or the governing board of the school is one slice of the autonomy cake, then let's negotiate our way into that. So let's, let's unpack the autonomy and then we will end up getting slices of the big elephant we are calling autonomy. But if we, if we go with autonomy... It, <laughs> it means different things to different people. All right, so based on that, I have a question. And um, Mr. Bene, if you can take this for us, please. It's from a concerned citizen, and it's related to the elephant you call autonomy. Please, does this concept of autonomy factor the satisfaction of teachers and their needs and that of students in the schools under consideration? If yes, how prepared are we to strike the balance between government policies and the policies of other partners? Um, the needs of teachers and students uh, and their development and the outcomes, uh, that's central to the discussion because all we are talking about is teachers teaching, students learning, and having excellent outcomes from their interaction. That's all that we are talking about. But the processes that ensure that is where there's some difference between policy and advocacy. I sat in a training program organized by NACA, who are in charge of drawing up the curriculum. And there's supposed to be a new curriculum coming out, even though the old one hasn't even been fully implemented. It's only this year, after about is it three years, that uh, they started distribute. after four years, that they started distributing textbooks. And they're already drawing up a new uh, curriculum. And the only thing I could see different was an emphasis on the use of computers and some training for kids. I used to consult for the IFC in education, and I remember that when you talk about curriculum, it's not just the content, the, what, what is taught, but also how it's evaluated, both teacher and student evaluation, and even the um, 
uh, the uh, um, not also how it's taught, but also um, uh, the environment for teaching and learning, right? So at question time, I raised my hand and I asked the director why there was nothing about teacher evaluation in the curriculum. And he said, well, that's not their business. That's for someone else to deal with, all right? Now, if you're drafting a new curriculum and there's nothing about, there's no feedback mechanism built into it, how are you going to know if you're getting the right outcomes? But if we have the right partnership, this gap in the curriculum drafting could be fixed at the school level because if the school board, which is, to use your terminology, one slice of the autonomy uh, discussion, if the school board had real control over teacher engagement and linking teacher remuneration and promotions to the, uh, to the outcomes of their work, then even though the new curriculum messes out on that, it could be implemented at the school level. So um, the question actually points at something that's central to the whole discussion. All right. Um, to our keynote speaker, Mr. Baden, a question here. And I know when the questioner says you, he doesn't mean you, but I think he means the alumni group that is pushing this. It says, do you intend to have this autonomy concept captured as a national education policy? Because it seems from all the discussions we've had here, unless there's something, some willingness, cooperation from the top, it may be difficult to just fully implement or get it through. As I, as I pointed out in, in my speech, the different kinds of autonomy, as Kofi said, but it also depends on the legal origins of the school, what they can do and what they can't do. You can't just wish yourself into autonomy. There has to be a process. There has to be a strategy. There has to be some legal or constructive engagement path that will take you to where you want to get to. As long as we know that this free SHS is fantastic, but it's too expensive, there must be a way to dialogue to achieve the free SHS, but in an enhanced version without politicizing it. Alumni have all kinds of people, whether NDC or MPP in it. So on the platform in the Alliance, when alumni speaks, it's not about party politics. You know, in 25, we can have only one or two presidents. Is that gonna be ex-president Mahama or the sister vice president? I don't see why they're not they're not dangerous. We can dialogue with them. <laughs> we can ask them what they intend to do. We can influence their thinking as to what they put in their manifesto. And we can find the path that we can have a win-win solution. That's why I bothered to spell out the different kinds of autonomy. Because autonomy is for a purpose. And I also pointed out, I mean, if you take a school like Achimota, it's owned by the government 100%. You can't go and tell the government, give us the school. They'll say the school is not yours. That's why I mentioned the story in the beginning about Chapel Hill, where the alumni want the school to do this and that and that, but the school belongs to some other people who are all over the world and are no longer there. And they are saying, how do we get this school to work? But they don't have any control. So there needs to be a dialogue. There's some conversion in strategy that dictates that depending on how you are brought into being, you can find a path to whichever autonomy works for you. For us at Infanspum, we insist that the school does not belong to the government. The government has to prove legally that it belongs to them, right? We also insist that we voluntarily went for assistance. But we know that we are within a sovereign state that has a government. If we say we do no longer want assistance, then we have to show that we can pay for our independence. Without showing that you can pay for your independence, then you're gonna create, create chaos. You can't go to the government and say, give me the school. Okay, give me a plan. You say you do this, you do Where's your money? That's why we are focused on our endowment fund. And I can bet you that if we have the money, you see what we are made up of. So let's focus on the strategy and the resources. I don't think, I believe everything is possible. We have to find a way to do it. If it comes to 
either one of two persons in 25. Maybe this is the time they could speak to them, right? And, and once you're speaking on an alumni platform, it's not about politics. We should not be seen as enemies. We should be seen as different parties interested in the best outcomes, you know, and take the politics out of it. I believe it can be done. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Baden. Please, a round of applause for our panel. So I know we've taken some text messages, but some of you may have questions you may want to put forward to our panel. So this is um, a chance to do so. So please, I can take any three questions to start with. One, two, third one. There's a third person. Okay, three, all right. Please, can we give them mics? Thank you, sir. Hello, thank you very much. Um, in the discussion going on, um, I come to realize that there are grade A schools. And these grade A schools are the schools that are largely targeted. Now, the numbers in the schools. In Fansum, for instance, is about 4,000. Achimota is 4,000. So if everyone targets to go to grade A schools and they leave the grade C and D schools, can the grade A schools take over the grade C and D schools and expand? Because nobody is going there anyway. So for instance, in Fansum School, it's a pure art school. And then we take over a grade D school in Ashanti region. And then there's Infancement Science School. We take over another grade D school in the Western region. It is Infancement, say again, technical. <laughs> yeah, that's my thinking. Thank you very much for that. Uh, please, let's take note of that. Please, a second person should ask his question. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my name is Michael Ansa. I just want to make a contribution. Uh, first of all, thank you all for what's been a very invigorating and uh, like visionary uh, contributions that you've all made. Um, I spent uh, a lot of my recent life, so I've, I've lived quite a long time, uh, in the UK. <laughs> And um, if you look at the systems there, you know, I went through um, you know, a stage bringing up my children, educating them. Uh, my wife and I chose to take them to boarding schools. And like you rightly said, you pay for boarding school. And it's a tough thing to do. But we chose to do that and gave them that education. The government has provided comprehensive education for everybody. So if you want to go to a free school, you go to a comprehensive school. And some of them are great, they are grammar schools, some of them are great, and they give you excellent education. All of them end up in some of the top universities. Of course, you know, you would argue, some, somebody would argue that maybe the boarding schools get a disproportionate access to the top universities. But that's a choice. So I just want to lay down where I'm coming from. There was also a policy uh, during the, I think, post-Thatcher years of having the opportunity for schools to opt out of local authority control. Local authority is similar to the kinds of systems that we have here, free SHS, free for all. The same sort of budgets you're talking about is given to everybody regardless of even the infrastructure in the school. So some schools have the opportunity to opt out of that and therefore gain a certain uh, 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 standard or some autonomy, okay? So talking of your slices of autonomy, gain some autonomy. But then, I think we should look a little bit beyond that. And perhaps the timing is also right. If the IMF today or through the government's own, the government that's implemented free SHS is saying that they can look at revising this, then of course the door is open for uh, you know, all kinds of ideas to come to the table. And I think there is a real opportunity for schools like uh, Achimota and Fanspim, Wesley Girls, you know, I don't want to use the A grade type schools. But, you know, certain schools, to be able to come up with a model that says, look, a certain percentage of students will sit exams and pay to enter these schools, okay? 
we'll also make sure that we create a scholarship system for a certain percentage of people who would have access using your uh, you know, uh, uh, models of uh, uh, means testing, etc. They can sit exams and come to this, these schools. So ultimately, the school will not be just pure fee paying, but there will be a statutory percentage, 25%, 30%, whatever, that the math can support. And that's the beginnings of what you start to do. So I think, first of all, there's a need for a policy that we all should put our hands to mission schools, other schools, etc., that want to belong to this, a policy that should go to government. First of all, to allow certain schools who can demonstrate the ability to put a proposal together to manage their schools, to opt out of this. It frees up funds for the rest of the schools. And once that policy is in place, then all schools can then convince government why you should be given that uh, uh, authority, you know, authority to manage your school. And of course, you set up governing systems that make all these schools charitable schools. So it's not for profit making. It's not like GIS or any, any school of that sort. It's probably more like SOS. But then it's, it's, a, it's, it's a charitable institution, fee paying uh, to you know, 60% or whatever can support the math. And then an opportunity for people who, ca who uh, cannot afford it to have scholarships to go to these schools. And I agree, once you do all your metrics that said, you know, two toilets support, you know, X number of people, et cetera, you end up with, say, a thousand in Achimota school. In my days in Achimota school, I don't think we were more than a thousand students, okay? And that's what we should aim to do, because that's all about standards. This is all about quality of our education, and this is all about the future. And I know, you know, I mean, when we're going to school, you know, uh, uh, friends of mine, their parents came from deep villages, but they had scholarships to come to school. You refer to Coco scholarships. I know some of the richest Ghanaians who were on Coco scholarship because of how the system was. Okay, so, so, so that itself was not foolproof. But I think there are ways in which we can look at these models to make it work. And I think the window is now. We need that opt-out policy. I'm using that statement, but we can call it something else. A policy that's presented to government by a large group of, uh, of schools so that there's you know, some critical mass behind this. It's not just one, two, three schools, but you know, it allows mission schools, it allows everybody who can to opt out. And then we have the system. Free SHS is great, and that's something that I wholeheartedly support. But government should build it out. Lastly, I had a deep conversation with a former minister for education on this whole free SHS matter, because my thinking was that there's a way of mixing it all up. He says, Michael, better said in chief, Ghana dear, Oka Secondary School and no anybody school. So, so as far as he sees it, free SHS without boarding school is not free SHS. And that's something that we have to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please, let's take the last uh, question, or the third question, and then we'll come back to the panel. So, Reverend Afoble, while we, okay, go ahead. This has been an interesting discussion for a number of reasons. Um, I'm curious um, about the work of the uh, alumni group. And the word autonomy has been kind of dissected in a number of ways. I'm just going to ask, is partial autonomy an option? Or are we, is it full autonomy, aut 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 autonomy or nothing? So that's one question. And then secondly, just listening to Mr. Asari, it seems that our government has gone for a particular form of free education and just um, piggybacking on um, what Michael said. Um, is there, I mean, if, if we are beginning to ask questions about the model, is it time to begin to actually ask about the model of free SHS itself that we have chosen? Because I think a lot of the in, in, in a lot of the angst around autonomy, we are actually dealing with the symptoms of a particular form of free SHS that we have adopted. And if we are to go to a kind of first principles approach on this, then we need to be looking at that model itself and the kind of outcomes that we are getting and why we are where we are and what we then need to change. So that's just 
the question and the contribution. Thank you, Thank you very much, sir. So, uh, Reverend Amafuble, please take the first question. Is it possible, he, he's asking, since it is the category A schools most people want to go to, people don't want to go to a category D school. He says some of the category A schools could, in a better way, maybe mentor or bring up those schools to be like them. There's always the joke among the Prisecans. There is Prisec Legon, Prisec Odumasi, and, and the like. So I don't know what you think of that. So far, what is this is that we have uh, teachers, and I did this in my time, took teachers, especially assistant heads, from Sabres Legal, put them in certain schools, and they turned the schools around. Um, as for taking over another school, I'm not too sure. <laughs> yes. Um, for example, personally, I was instrumental in this establishing Manfi, Methodist Girls. Yeah. And I put an old girl there as a head. And the school is now a category. I mean, it can be done. But it depends on... Um, no. What we are talking about now that I can see it's not in that same line. It's not in that same line. Yeah. But I, I think the, the outlook, which I know the Minister of Education had talked about, which is why he's been building these STEM schools across the country. It, he, and I remember this because I interviewed him, I think, in 2021, uh, where he said he didn't want us to just be fussing over Wesley Girls or Achimota and the like, but we should have other schools grow new schools that can compete with these schools so that others would want to go there. But friend, what I feel we are doing here is we want other schools to come up. But these are all schools that have people that are, they feel some commitment towards that school. And they want to help the system to improve. Yes, go ahead, establish other schools. But you can't try to make everybody the same. I mean, it's not possible. You know, so my fear, it, it may not be founded. The current system we are running, there will come a time that we will not have alumni that are so passionate about their schools as to bring people together and even initiate such conversation. And um, maybe I'm wrong, but it, it should be a disaster. <laughs> but, be a disaster. but I guess it's something to, to worry about or think about. All right, so um, any comments on Mike's um, extensive point, which I think w was a good one, and then, um, Kofi, please uh, answer the third question now when the time comes. So, uh, Mr. Bennett, you can go ahead. Um, so, just commenting on, uh, you know, uh, it's not enough to have excellent schools that operate in silos. So, in the paper that we've been pushing since 2018, we looked at how whatever excellence we achieve can permeate the entire education system. Um, the first thing is, it's not only about category A schools, right? Any school that thinks that it can stand on its own two feet should be able to apply and be awarded some autonomy based on clear policy criteria. So the Alumni Alliance, we've got schools from all over the country. It's not just category A schools, so-called category A schools. The second thing is any school, and we are, we are calling it the um, uh, charter schools, that you should be able to apply for a charter. And when you apply, 
your application must have a sponsor. So uh, the mission school, for instance, the mission could be the sponsor for Achimoto School, could be the um, alumni body. Now, any charter school that, and in, in, and in being awarded a charter, you sign an agreement with the government so that they are clear deliverables. If you don't achieve those, after a while, you lose your charter status. Now, any school that's able to achieve success in that framework should have one or two sister schools where you have exchange programs, joint training, um, and even share some of your financial resources. Uh, and this is our proposal, so that the excellence that is achieved will then disseminate and other schools can then also come up. And if a charter school loses government funding, our proposal is that that funding shouldn't be taken out of education. It should be redirected to another school so that together we are increasing the resource envelope in, in education. So, and, and these proposals, if I, I think the last time um, our president gave it to the Minister of Finance about a couple of months ago, we, we've shared it, everybody in government has seen it. So that's a partial answer to our third uh, questioner, but Kofi, um, he, he raised some points, please uh, answer. I, I, I think that if we don't fix fundamental challenges in our secondary education system, and we grant autonomy to category A schools and even other category B schools that, are, that want to be autonomous, we will still have the challenges we are facing. Some of the challenges are foundational. The best model for free secondary education in Africa is South Africa. They've been doing K-12 for about two decades. Pre-apartheid, it was there, but for all, about two decades. You enter kindergarten one in this school and you complete senior high school training in that school. From there, you are going to university. There's no school selection and placement. That's the model Brazil has run, a model Argentina has run, and it is strictly day, strictly day. You can't afford a 75% board in secondary education. You can't. A country that goes to the IMF hospital ward, uh, the IMF ward every five years cannot even have that. It's not possible. You can't. No one should tell us that it is not sustainable because you are doing close to feeding alone. I mean, it's not possible. And so we must, we have a model at, at Edwards. We must have a plan to transition Ghana from a boarding as a norm secondary education system to a day as a norm. Boarding as an exception. If you live in Tatale Sanguli and the distance from your community to the nearest day, day school is more than 10 kilometers or eight kilometers, then you are entitled to compulsory boarding education, which is free. But if I live in Medina, and the computer placement, we are, we are all aware that you are supposed to select one school, which is there. And it, the school must be within a 13 to 15 kilometer radius. So if you select a school that is more than 15 kilometers, the computer will not even allow you to select it. It means that we have identified that every Ghanaian student has reasonable access to a day senior high school near them. So if I live in Medina, and I'm placed in Achimota, or I'm placed in Presec, or was, I have no business thinking about free boarding, then you have to pay. So one way to make our secondary education system sustainable is to move from the current boarding as a norm to day as a norm. If we do that, you realize that Achimota perhaps, perhaps will be able to take even 5,000 students. Yes, because you are going to move from 80% boarding to 20% boarding. And Presec is not doing 5,500. Presec can do 8,000. Because FISEC is doing 85% boarding and 15% and day now. So it is the cheapest, not cheapest, not cheapest, it's the most cost efficient model we can think of. And this is not rocket science. That's, this is the international best practice. So that's obviously the way to go. But the challenge is that, the challenge is that, because across political divides, every eight, every four or eight years, an administration comes and reverses significantly what has been done by the previous administration. It is likely that government A comes, X 
the, the current government's plan or strategy to expand equitable access is one, to expand existing boarding senior high schools, not build new ones. So over 800, pro I mean, there are projects taking place in about 800 schools, or mainly to expand the capacity of existing senior high schools, including Wesley Girls and Co. Wesley Girls used to take up only 700, now they are doing in the thousands. And then two, build the new ones, the new STEM schools that you are seeing. So in all respects, the expansion is along the line of modernization. The previous government sought to expand secondary education access through the day concept. And we know what happened. So if we, if we don't marry the two concepts at a point, we will end up wasting too much money on abandoned projects, and we are seeing them. That, for me, is where the challenge is, how to marry the two concepts and come to a win-win situation. Other than that, we, we, we cannot sustain the uh, burden as a norm secondary education system. It's not possible. Thank you very much, Kofi, uh, for that. As for shifting away to day being the norm, after telling all these wonderful stories of secondary school boarding, the children don't want to be with you at home. <laughs> That's the reality. My daughter has changed after going away for a term and coming back. So I, I don't know. I, maybe it's a Ghana thing, but I don't know if we'll get there. Let's take a few questions if... Um, Joel, can we take a few more questions? All right, let's take three more and they will wrap up. <laughs> so, yes, Mr. Zumanu, um, Madam sitting next to Dr. Brookman Emisa. Um, a third one? Okay, Philip, go ahead. Thank you, Jifa. Um, Kofi, it's nice to know that you haven't changed. <laughs> so, uh, it's good to know. I, I've been involved in this autonomy business 10 years back. And the excuse we got at the time was a problem with how sincere these schools will be with respect to making sure that we use the right methodologies to get students or equal access for students to get into these schools. The fear was that to become elitist and people like us will never have gone to Achimota if we're implementing it in the way that it was done. I want to know what are the excuses that you are getting today? Because from, my, from what you've said, it means that you've dealt with different you know, um, authorities and different politicians. I believe each of them will give you a reason why they don't believe that is the right way to go. If we can understand what their reasons are against it, probably we can plan a better strategy. So can you share with us from your experience, what are the excuses that they are giving you or the reasons why they will not give autonomy to the schools as we are requesting. Thank you. All right. Please, madam, second question. Hi, everyone. Uh, a wonderful discourse. And I'm sitting here with about 50 questions in my head. I don't know which one to ask. Um, I'll give you a bit of a case history, but I think the question I actually want to ask is how do we move away <clears throat> from the politicization of education? I think that's my main question. But I will also add that I am the product of a huge mix of all of this. And in somewhat, I'm sitting here thinking education should be available to everybody, but I understand that we have to have a classes system, no matter which way we look at it. If you can afford, you pay for the quality that you can afford. And if you cannot afford, you take what is free, but free has to be standardized so that you're getting access the same way those who pay get access. And the reason why I'm thinking that, so this is now an additional rather than a question, is that I boarded from the age of six. I started boarding school at Achimota Primary. I went for interview. I got a scholarship. Um, and did, so I'm an Akuret as well as an Akura. And then I did two years at Achimota, and because of family circumstances, my father actually was very ill, we moved to the UK. And we went from a middle class family in Ghana to what we'll call a working class family in the UK, because we went to a single, fam a single parent family. Because the quality of education access in the UK is so different to Ghana, although we went to our local comprehensive, all of us were still able to go to Russell Group universities. 
So something happened there that allowed that, that access that I would never have had if we stayed in Ghana because our access to the class A type of school, so to speak, would have changed. I want children who are like me to end up getting access to good universities coming from a comprehensive, as our gentleman said here. I also ended up as an educator in the UK. So I taught in the UK for 25 years in comprehensive schools in London. So I and appreciate there's so many things that we need to think about, but the boarding aspect is creating a massive problem for us in Ghana. And we really need to have an honest conversation about what we reminisce about, uh, which were wonderful, but we have to have an honest conversation about what is affordable that gives the best access to everybody. So that's my contribution, but the question is the politics. What do we do about it? Thank you very much. So those were the last two. Mr. President says two, so I must obey. So um, Philip asked a question. I think, Mr. Bennett, that seemed more directed at you. What, have you been able to glean what the reasons are for which it seems the powers that be are not warming up to the idea of autonomy in whatever form it is? So, um, because I've been a bit fed up, I'm going to be blunt. <laughs> <laughs> One, the public reason is the same as Mr. Zumanu said. Uh, the fear that it will create a class system and it will deny access to uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds and all of that. Um, but to me, that's not a real fear because it can be addressed through policy, okay? And we have preempted it in all the discussions that we've had and shown how, and you know, the simple math that both um, Mr. Sari and Mr. Baden said, if someone can pay for another person to go to school free, why do you fear that the person who is getting it for free will not get it? Okay, just to ensure it through policy and regulation. That's all. So um, that's not a real fear. So that's one thing. The second thing, the second feedback which we get privately is this will be a difficult sell. And that's where the politics comes in. A difficult sell in the political space. So the politicians will tell you, how are we going to justify this? Okay. Okay. And um, we, we, we tell them that you're actually doing a good thing by attracting more resources into education. And we even offered that, again, not to create that as just a uniquely Achimota proposal, but what we offered was, okay, if we are raising 10 million, Take two million out of it, share 250,000 to eight schools, and if schools that do not have money are benefiting from our fundraising, perhaps if you highlight that, it would reduce any, because we, we are realistic. There is a political, there could be a political cost. But if we focus on the positives and how it lifts the entire education system, I have faith that Ghanaians would understand because we are not fools. We can see that there is a problem. Um, Mr. Sari's, just the last, Mr. Sari's um, uh, outfit has a, has a paper and it clearly shows that the, in the first place, the allocation to the education budget to free SHS this year is 10% less than the allocation for last year. And in real terms, is equivalent to the 2019 allocation. Because of inflation. Meanwhile, numbers have gone up. So, you, are, you don't have the money. You too, you won't let anybody help you. 
How about a reason I would like to give you? Control. It's about control. It's about who is controlling. Even though there is the computerized system, it's about control, who gets into these schools. It's about who becomes powerful because a lot of the power has been taken away from the headmasters, exactly. headmistresses, and, and the like. So and maybe exactly. it's not even the first two. And it's more about, to about the to control. That, to um, the last question. Yes, you see, please go ahead. There are two things they, they will not, and this is not the government, but the political class, regardless of who is at the helm. The political class have a deep interest in secondary education. I see them in two dimensions. Three, the first one, what you mentioned is one. But there are two others. The second is procurement. And I'm being honest. That's the, that's the interest of the political class. Procurement. Okay? Because immediately you grant autonomy to secondary schools. The meaning is that um, the, the 10 million I mentioned as an annual budget for school A will no more be procured Oh, the terms that I mentioned, only about 10% will get to the school loan. 90% of that money will be procured for you. Yes. So procurement is, is centralized. Okay. So if you devolve procurement, if you grant autonomy, you are devolving procurement to the schools, right? And so who will supply food will not be determined by someone else than buffer stock. That, that's, that, that's a fact, but they won't tell you. The, the other one is the control over admissions. If you do a political economy analysis of our secondary education system, these two things are the strongest political interest. Since the computerized school placement was introduced, there is a lot more political capital in the mechanisms of the school placement than any other capital. So the control over who, the control over admissions into category A schools is a strong political at least for the past 15 years that I've been monitoring the mechanisms of the school placement. And that's something that it's difficult to let go, but they won't tell you. <laughs> All right. Um, Mr. Bene, if you can just hold that point for a moment. I'm just telling you how I, uh, I got to know this man. We attended a Get Fund event, and uh, I took advantage to make the point because the minister was there. Uh, and as soon as I finished, he was sitting behind me. He just reached out and said, Yeah, was someone okay, you know, yeah, I'm foul. You want. <laughs> You want to come and put your small money in, and then you start asking, who is supplied, who is supplied? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> so, um, a question asked by the lady, I would like that to go to you, Reverend Ama Fobley. She wants to know, what can we do to depoliticize education? Because it's clear that with political hands in, in it, it's difficult to get policy through, it's difficult to get a meeting of minds on things that could actually help the school. Even something as simple as parent-teacher associations who were contributing and all that, all that has been stopped. Teachers are sanctioned or headmasters, headmistresses are sanctioned just because maybe they may have accepted to do one thing or the other just because they want to help the school. <laughs> My dear, I don't know how I'm going to answer that question. <laughs> But what I can say is that for the PTAs, for example, some heads were also abusing the whole thing. And this is what brings about some of these uh, rulings and regulations. You know, when you ask every child to bring cement, every child to buy so many blocks, and it was really abusing the system. So to cut that short, is, uh, all these uh, regulations came in. Some were hiding behind PTAs to charge a whole lot of unauthorized fees. And uh, students are sent away uh, from exams because they have not paid PTA uh, dues and things like that. That's why all those things came. Okay, that's just one example I admit, but I think her but, main uh, concern... You know, one thing about the boarding school, our home situation is also another thing. Fijai Secondary School started as a, a day school. It was a very good day school. Now it's a boarding school. 
I taught at Aquinas Secondary School. Purely boys day school. I, um, in my younger days, I was a bit of a night bird. And I noticed that uh, some of the students, and uh, you could, you know, few were, so you could recognize them. You will see them on the street lights studying. And uh, it, it, it got me so worried, I managed to talk the school administration into allowing the final years to camp in the school, created toilet facilities for them, and I told them, you get up in the morning, do this, do that, get everything ready, because they were sleeping in classrooms. Clean up, arrange the desk so classes can go on. And that's how we started turning the results of Aquinas round. And at a time, Aquinas topped the whole country. Because people were, they were facilitated for them to study. That's why people always want to go to a boarding school. You, five, six people in a room, and you want to put on the light to study. Others want to sleep. Or the cost of electricity. So parents, you know, come in with all this. But still, I, I, I feel that we should gradually try to de-emphasize boarding. It's very expensive. Very expensive. So these conversations can go on, and we'll see how best we do, can Do you foresee that in Ghana maybe we'll shift as Kofi is suggesting to more of a day, free senior high school it day? It will take a very long time. Yeah. It can happen. But suddenly, perhaps after my lifetime. <laughs> All right, and we are wrapping up. But before we do, the students from Achimota, any of you have some questions you like to put to the honorable panel? Please. Yes, go ahead. Please, can someone give him a mic? Go ahead, mention your name and what year you are in, and go ahead. Please, good evening, everyone. My name is Edward Williams, and I'm in Form 3 of the Achimota School. Um, <coughs> so please pardon my shakiness, but in some people have the fear of public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> some, some people fear public speaking, and they fear death, too. Yes. So, um, from my point of view, I feel like the topic at hand is mostly centralized on and the financial part of it. But then, is it going to continue if we are granted autonomy? And are we going to be able to provide our finances till? So you are wondering about whether the money will keep coming yes, and for also, over a long period. Yes, and also that when the management is changed or when these very wonderful people of ours with great minds have been changed. Is it going to continue? Are we going to run back to the government? And Thank you. I think that's a really important question. Please, any, anyone else, um, our young students? Yes, please go ahead. And don't have a fear of public speaking. You are an Achimotan. <laughs> okay. Um, more... I'm, I'm here for Tsiang. I'm also in Form 3 in Achimota School. More of this, or I say most of the arguments is about the money. How sure are we that even after this money comes in, it will change the lives of the students? Like, in the sense that right now we are in a system where sometimes you go home for about three months and we are left out of school. We don't, we have to um, go for extra classes before we can be able to learn. Um, will these policies change that for us? Or will we still be going by the same system that is plaguing us right now? Because we really suffered. We really suffered. 
All right, thank you. I think those are two very good questions. Thank you for, for asking. Um, let me come to you, keynote speaker, because I think he's mentioned, two of them have mentioned a key point. For how long will the money keep coming? Will it keep coming forever? The other question also is, now we have, I've actually even lost track, gold, bl green, whatever. Will the system change for the youngsters where also their parents won't have to be paying so much for extra classes? Because as soon as they come home, they are going for classes. I think the, the essence of this whole debate, discussion, brainstorming is to find not just how to improve quality of education, but also how to make it sustainable. And Mr. Bennett has mentioned that before you can opt out, there has to be a criteria of which you can opt out. That criteria must stand on the foundation of sustainability. So the detail of that will inform the choice of the government as to whether you can opt out or not. If whatever you present gives an opt-out option that's not sustainable, then you shouldn't be granted it. And one of the foundations of the speech I gave was that you have to give cognizance to the type of or the legal form of the school that we're talking about. I talked about private schools, mission schools, and government schools. The pathway to autonomy or the nature of the autonomy or the degree of the autonomy will be dictated also by those legal precepts. For us at Enfanspoom, we maintain that we went for assistance. We don't want assistance in the art. We are opting out of government aid. So our model is going to be based on the model where we can tell the government that we have more money than what you assist us with, and we are sustainable. Once we have independence, it doesn't mean that we don't want to build an elite school. How do we prevent that coming to the last but one gentleman, I think? is to understand the objectives that we want to achieve and let the legal form follow the objectives. For instance, our mode of, the f of thinking about the future is to say that we're going to be a company limited by guarantee and non-profit, which means that all the money that we get from whatever model is going to be reinvested into the school. And the reason why it's urgent, I think... Reverend Alfred, they just mentioned it. Today, Ghana's low country that I know, where the alumni are so passionate, the people literally, I mean, Kofi Annan literally sold his paintings, all his paintings to give to the France people. Just when I was going to campaign to be a Busia Paying, I went to uh, Mobile 1965. One person promised me that when he dies, he's going to will half of his properties to the France people. And another pers person has promised me a 500 acre farm. Now, where would you find such emotionally charged people, emotionally attached to the school? It's because of the experience that was built in the school. Somebody called me and said, oh, Moses, how are you going to run all these businesses and run them fans for money? It's not too much. It might be too much. I don't know why I want to do it. But there's something in me that wants to do it. That thing that in me might not be necessarily in the people that, you know, just stay three years in fans for and never meet each other. It's a different thing. So it's either we want the resources of these alumni who are willing to give it freely to the school, or want to wait till they are gone with their resources, and then run schools that run down anyway, and we rebuild schools, right? I told you the history of Chapel Hill. Because 32 families owned it, in the end, the families left. Decisions could not be made. So what did my family do? We built a brand new school, a whole brand new school. Because there was still the desire to build a school. Now, that school has a 1,000 students, which is much more than Chapel Hill. So maybe one day, the alumni will decide, let's forget them first, and let's build another school. In which case, the country loses. I believe that because the path that we're choosing ultimately needs to evolve. It is not a political issue. It's a common sense issue that we cannot do something that we can't sustain. And we must review what we've done in order to get better. So that time will come, I believe. Thank you very much, our keynote speaker.
Yes, go ahead, uh, Reverend Amafugli. In connection with the autonomy, I feel then we will be able, or the school or the management, will have a greater hand in selecting a head for the school. This system where, uh, because you, you, you are at a certain grade, you apply to be a head, you may not have the managerial skills actually to head a school. I'm looking at a time where a school management can even look at somebody who has not been in the mainstream GES teaching thing to head the school and manage the school in a very business-like manner. So there are so many pluses to if this can become a reality. And I pray it becomes a reality. <laughs> Let, let's talk about it. Um, Mr. Bennett, so one of the young man, he did ask, so what happens when the firebrands like you, who have the ideas, the leaders of the old Achimotan Association, the various year groups are not there to push it? What happens then to this whole idea? <laughs> well, uh, I can assure the young man that these are not personality-driven initiatives. Okay, so um, we are building institutions. So when you look at the um, Achimoto School Endowment Trust Fund, it is a company limited by guarantee incorporated at the Registrar General. Um, it has trustees and directors um, and We've changed. It's actually been around since 1999. Uh, it's gone through several iterations. And our objective is to raise enough money that we cover sustainably, cover the expenses of the school into the long term. So it's not a one-off initiative, okay? We are building an institution to support the school on an ongoing basis. Rest assured, if we are successful, your problems will disappear. And hopefully you become an Accra who will also continue the fight. I'll give the final word to Mr. Sari and we'll call this an end. So as somebody in, in policy who's been monitoring all this for years, what advice do you have for us? alumni of this great school and then the Alumni Alliance that is looking at uh, this issue of autonomy. And have it in policy. And then gradually we'll get to the point where we believe that the old students of the school are having a greater say, because that's all we want to have, a greater say in the way the school is run. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, a round of applause for our panelists. Many thanks to Reverend Ama Afoble. Many thanks to Mr. Yaobene Amponsa. Many thanks to Kofi Asari and to our keynote speaker as well, Mr. Moses Baden. Many thanks for joining us via WhatsApp online and present. Thank you. very much ladies and gentlemen let's hear it again for our panel <laughs> it's been a, an extremely meaty conversation um, a lot of conversation um, a lot of substance in here and the hope is that the conversation continues to spread there's a lot of work that's been going on on the ground with this and long may the actions of this be realized thank you very much <laughs> now I would like to invite Mr. the chairman of Achimosa Speaks, Mr. Ernest Kwesi Okon, to come and give some recognition where it is due. Thank you, Baba. Uh, good evening, everybody. Giving recognition where it's due it goes without saying that we have to appreciate our 
the people on our panel for such a wonderful job. It is gratifying when you have a panel that delivers. Then it, it also gratifies us who have arranged for it to happen. So thank you very much. But it would not have worked perfectly if we didn't have a good appreciative audience, an audience that understands what is going on and participates very well. I noticed that there was a lot of attention being paid to what was being said. So thank you, all of you, for being here yourselves. <laughs> but my main job is to give away certificates to our panel and the key to know speaker and everybody on the stage as a, a, a token of our appreciation of the work they've done tonight. So, I'm ready for you. Yeah. Um, normally at sessions like this, I, I choose people from the, from the audience to um, give away their certificates on our behalf. At the last one, I went the, a, a different way and uh, I think I'll do exactly the same this time. This is an Achibota event, whether we like it or not. <laughs> MOBA notwithstanding. <laughs> so I'm going to ask again that the headmaster of Achibota School, Mr. Ebenezer Akwa, to please come up. <laughs> Quick, first one is for him. Let's ask the lady, ladies first. Thank you very much, Headmaster. I'll, I'll give ladies first. Normally, I, I go in a different way, but this time I'm going ladies first, if you don't mind. So, Ms. Headmaster. Yes. Thank you very much. Please wait. Um, the next one is two. Okay. Uh, Jifa, for, for, for the purposes of this thing, uh, I, I'm not counting you as a lady just for today. <laughs> Ms. Headmaster, would please be kind enough to present this certificate to our keynote speaker, Mr. Moses B um, Baden, for the... Very strong speech you made, and for the ideas he's given all of us. Yep. Send master a certificate for Mr. Yao, Bena Amponsa, fantastic speaker. Well done. And then to our able expert, Mr. Kofi Asari. <clears throat> and now the analysts have finished. The person who glued everything together, Madam, uh, Mr. Headmaster, please give this to Jifa Bampo. Thank you, Mr. Headmaster. So I think that um, that is a token to all the speakers for what they have done for us tonight. My last thanks to all of you, and uh, well done, each of you. Thank you very much, Accra Akon. Um, it's my pleasure to... It's my pleasure to invite up the president of the OAA, Mr. Joel Nete. As Mr. Nete comes up, let me please remind you that there are some refreshments outside, extremely juicy kebabs outside. So you can stop by. <laughs> you can stop by. For, yes, for sale. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Baba. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree that it's been a night well spent. I want to add my personal thank yous once again to our keynote speaker, Ebisa Peng elect Moses Baden, and our great team of panelists, the very Reverend Amar Fobley, um, Mr. Kwesia Sari, and our very own Yabena Ponsa. Accra Jifa, I'm, as I'm sure you know, as advertised, Bernard Avle of CTFM was supposed to be a moderator. He took ill at the very last minute. And so just an hour or an hour and a half into the program, I reached out to Jifa and she said, of course, she'll be happy to moderate. So I think she deserves a further round of applause. Just, just by way of a quick summary, um, Moses, thank you very much once again spoke to us about the impact of second cycle institutions transcending academics. It's the foundation based on which national values and aspirations are built. He gave us a historical account of the evolution of secondary school education and suggests that there's a nexus between autonomy and success. He said to us that there's a need for a bipartisan dialogue on how to improve the current educational system, which was re-echoed in all the the panel discussions, and of course, the, the comments from the floor. Um, he said that we have to look at models that have worked in other parts of the world. We are not an island unto ourselves. I think the important thing is that whatever it is that we choose, it must work in our context. But it's happened, it's worked in different countries, different models have worked. It's for us to, quote unquote, copy with pride and make sure that whatever it is that we choose works for our Ghana. There also the, is the call for um, with, that within the context of secondary education, the importance of collaborative structures offer schools flexibility, control, and responsibility necessary to innovate, adapt to local needs, and drive continuous improvement. He said we need to design and implement policy reforms that leverage whatever our strengths are, alumni, church, and private sector resources, and expertise to enhance educational access and outcomes. He did say a quote that I, very, I like very much. It's easier to build stronger children than to repair broken men. If you look at discipline alone in our schools today, we are farming them out, these broken men and women. And it's up to us to try to stop them. As far as the panel discussion is concerned, great points from all our panelists Y'all spoke at length about being flexible in defining autonomy. I think Kofi agreed to that and said that we need to pick and choose how we put this, we package this economy, slice and dice it the way we will, which are the lowest hanging fruits, which are the most important things to us. Because if you go out there just selling, we want autonomy for autonomy's sake, chances are you will get a no. But if you can clearly define what constitutes autonomy and what you give back for the autonomy that we get, it improves our chances of success. Reverend, uh, the very Reverend Afobli spoke about this conversation being one that we should have had years ago. F free SHS is a fantastic idea. There are healthy and safety concerns also due to these factors. Kofi spoke about equitable financing and the need to disintegrate or unpack um, what we mean by autonomy, which I just spoke about. Lots, lots and lots of good points in today's discussion. And we thank our keynote speaker, and all our panelists for them. Let me tell you my own thoughts very quickly. You know this thing about a class society? It's a real concern. But it's not one that we can't address. And the fact that we are not averting our minds to it doesn't mean that we should just close the shop because we don't want to do the hard work. I'll put it bluntly. Category A schools in any system are important. Don't kill the category A schools. And I think the point has been made here that allow needy but brilliant students access into these category A schools, but also allow people who can pay to pay to enter these category A schools. What's happening right now, truth be told, is that we are forcing everybody to the bottom in a race to the bottom because we are killing quality across these schools because we think we are avoiding a class society. It's not working. It can't be autonomy for autonomy's sake. And I think the point has been made that to be given autonomy, you must demonstrate 
that you can raise the funds, manage the school, this, that, and the other. And the system can be put in place that says, if you don't meet the criteria over X, Y, Z period, it's taken away from you. There's nothing to fear but fear itself, ladies and gentlemen. One thing I've always said, that alumni bodies are the only ones that have a permanent interest in these our schools. So to the students who asked, is this sustainable? Yes, it is. And I think you'll answer that. Your headmasters will come and go. Politicians will come and go. The director generals of GES will come and go. The only group that retains a permanent interest in the success of their schools are the alumni bodies. You can't take decisions without including them or without at least engaging with them. My final thoughts. And I think we've heard that in different forms today. But I'll put it bluntly. Free SHS is good. The current blanket free SHS system that we are running is not good for this country. That needy but brilliant, forget even brilliant, that needy students must get opportunity for secondary education is not new. Kwame Nkrumah back in the day did the same thing. At the time, it was easier for him because it was a geography, right? You could say for the north, up, you could do that. Today, yes, poverty need is not a geography. So yes, we have to put in work to identify who's needy, who's this, who's that. But the fact that we are too lazy to put in the work doesn't mean we should offer everything free, including boarding, including electricity. It just isn't sustainable. So let's together as a country accept that if we want to democratize education, we should. It's important for the success of this country. But we can't do it wholesale. It just doesn't make sense. It just won't work. And we can see the results. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for attending Achimoto Speaks. And now we will ask, we'll ask the across to come off stage and help us do two quick things before we go. And finally, sincere thanks to our media partners, City FM, granting us interviews, pub helping us publicize it, and also recording this for post-event broadcasts. They were going to do live, but as I'm sure you know, the All African Games is live at this time, so they're recording it, and then we'll play back. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, once again. So come up, Accra team, and let's do two quick things. So to do that, ladies and gentlemen, can I kindly ask that you all rise on your feet? Can you grab the mics? Who wants my mic? You ready? God bless our homeland, Ghana. And make our nation great and strong. Go to defend forever the cause of freedom and of might. Fill our hearts with true humility. Make us cherish fearless honesty. And help us to resist oppressors who withhold our will and might forevermore. And help us to resist oppressors who withhold our will and might forevermore. See ye, Rejoice with us, ye nations, our cause is just forever. So let the nations cry with us. say ye, ye, O say ye, ye, O say ye, ye, O say 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 ye, ye. Thank you very much. And finally, in honor of the great Hashimoto School, what did they say? Mobile notwithstanding. Yeah. From Gambaga to Accra, from Riyosu to Geta, 
We are brothers and our mother is our school. She will guide us all and each so to learn that we may teach, so to subjugate ourselves that we may rule. Play the game, shout her name, spread her fame afar. She's the head of all the hosts, she's the school of whom we boast. She's the glory of the coast, Achimota. When our books are laid aside and we scatter far and wide, we remember with affection all we gained. How we learned to take our share in the life and labor there, where the men of whom we are proud of were trained. Play the game, shout her name, spread her fame afar. Ah, she's the head of all the host, she is the school of whom we boast, she is the glory of the coast. Ache Mota. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Infant Supreme School, for the strong showing. Thank you, Wesley Girls High School. Thank you, Abri Girls. Thank you, all members of the Alumni Association here present. It's really been a good day. We thank you very much and a good night.